Welcome to another presentation where we're looking about education as it moves into the future. In this entire series we're looking at evidence to plan the future. Evidence from research. Not opinion, not assertion, but evidence. The theme for the 11th presentation is what research reveals about attitudes and motivation. Someone wrote that a bad attitude is like a flat tire. If you don't change it, you'll go nowhere. When it comes to learning, if attitudes are negative, it's unlikely that too much learning will ever take place. Our attitudes and the motivations that arise from them underpin everything. Our student on the way to school? The body language says it all. And at school? Dreaming wonderful dreams is better than the effort of reading. And even at home, better to cover the face with the book we're supposed to study than to actually read it. And the poor teacher, what can we do about it? Can we do anything about it when attitudes are negative? It's almost as if the student sitting in front of us is saying to us, teach me if you dare. Many students have positive attitudes and great motivation, but we've all come across groups, individuals, even classes, where attitudes are not good and motivation is not high. What do we do about it? What does research tell us about attitudes and motivation? In this presentation we're going to ask that question, what are attitudes and what is motivation? And fundamentally ask why are there sometimes problems? And is there anything that we teachers can do about it all? So let's move forward. Now we're helped by an enormous amount of research evidence. Now much of it's come from social psychology and there's a vast wealth of very rich high quality research evidence from the field of social psychology that gives us a clear direction when it comes to both attitudes and motivation. What we've got to do is to take it and apply it into a learning situation in a school. So the principles are now well established and that does help us. Now this is a huge area and we're only going to introduce it and there'll be references at the end where if you want to follow it up you can do so. Social psychology has thrown a lot of light on what are the nature of attitudes hidden away in our brains. What are they? And why do they tend to be stable with time? We tend to be consistent, not always, but we tend to be. But we very often hold attitudes that actually contradict the evidence. Why does that arise and how can we do something about it? That's a huge topic on its own and we'll only just touch upon it. Are there mechanisms that allow attitudes to develop? And again, we won't really get much into this in this introductory presentation. Attitudes can be measured, but there are great limitations to this. Social psychology has developed sound methods. Tragically, in education, we've taken them in uncritically and applied them without the careful controls that psychology has used. There is a lot of research evidence. And this introductory presentation, we're going to look at what attitudes are. And the one thing that's true about all attitudes is that they involve evaluation.
And our future behaviour is influenced by the way we evaluate things. Could be positive, could be negative. So if we evaluate aspects of the learning journey negatively, that will influence our behaviour in the future and will not help us when it comes to learning in the future. But evaluation is perhaps the key word. In the world of education, and this is just one or two areas, we can hold attitudes towards the subjects we study. We can say, I like language, I hate history, I love biology, I hate mathematics, or whatever. We can hold attitudes towards teachers, the teachers that we really respond to, we respect, we feel we're learning something from, we look forward to their classes, but of course the reverse can be true. We can hold attitudes towards learning in general. What's the point of it all? Does it help me? Is it taking me forward? Is it relevant to me in my lifestyle? We can develop attitudes towards the topics and themes we study. We're studying a theme like perhaps pollution and we can develop attitudes towards pollution arising from our studies in that area. Wonderful research has shown that the attitudes that we adopt, they help us to make sense of everything around us. It's our way of evaluating life, evaluating experiences. We look at them positively or negatively. And it allows us to make sense of our world. Everything around us. It often allows us to make sense of ourselves. How we're reacting, what we're doing, why we should do it, why we shouldn't bother doing it. But it allows us to make sense of relationships with one another. Students with fellow students, students towards teachers, teachers towards students in an educational setting. So attitudes have a purpose. They can have various directions, but the key thing underpinning them all is they involve evaluation. And the way we evaluate things influences what we do in the future. So let's bring this together. Attitudes arise from evaluations. Now you can't just have an attitude or a positive attitude or a negative attitude. It's got to be directed at someone or something. A positive attitude towards learning. A positive attitude towards a subject textbook. A positive attitude towards the learning experience with a particular teacher. Attitudes are evolving evaluations, but the evaluations are directed at someone or something. But they strongly influence what we do in our future. If we evaluate study negatively, then we're not motivated to study in the future. Now, attitudes are not simply emotions. That's a misunderstanding. And again, the research has pulled this out and looked at it in detail. The evaluations have involved three dimensions, all of which are important. It involves what we know. You can't have an attitude towards biology. You can't evaluate biology without knowing something about what learning biology is all about. Yes, there are feelings. We like it, we don't like it. That's part of it. And sometimes we can't always pin down exactly why. But it's based on knowledge. But it's also based on experience. What we've done, what's been done to us. That develops the evaluation. So what we know, what we feel, what we experience 
gives us the basis of evaluation directed at something or someone which can influence future behaviour. I'm going to alter this frame very slightly. Now the only alteration is in the coloured coloured circle. Attitudes to study. Let's leave it general like that. It could be study in general or it could be study in a specific subject or a specific course with a specific teacher. But let's take it to attitudes to study. So we could think of studying as an activity. Students may have a positive attitude and a sense of fulfilment just by studying as an activity. They want to know more. They want to understand more. They want to experience more. But it could be related to the specific things that they have to study. And let's remember, adults determine what school students study. They don't have much say in it. The attitudes may be directed towards the specific teacher who directs the study in a specific course. And we may evaluate that teacher positively or negatively. And we've got to recognise this as teachers. That will happen. We need to look at why it happens, but it will happen. It could relate to the study materials where it is required to use. It could be a workbook, a handbook, a textbook worksheets, whatever. Or it could be attitudes to examinations. Examinations do immense damage because often they're a certificate of failure in the eyes of our learners. Now there's many, many more things we could add on. But attitudes towards study encompasses these things and perhaps these are the major ones. Now let's expand this. Our attitudes involve evaluations. And that relates to our knowledge of study and its relevance for us. How the individual student sees it. What their experiences and their knowledge of study is all about. It could of course relate to their likes and dislikes. And that could be as simple, they don't like the way a teacher approaches it. They don't like the accommodation they're placed in for a specific subject. Right across to the big issues, they don't see the point of it all. All comes back to experiences. What are the experiences of our students when it comes to study? That will contribute to their evaluation, which will strongly influence their future study. Now we focused on attitudes here. Motivation, where does it fit? And a word of warning here. A large amount of the literature, particularly in education, about motivation is just opinion. What I'm going to give here is something that's based on some evidence. The motivation, study is hard work. It's like climbing a mountain. We're putting one foot in front of the other on the snow slope. It's hard going. What motivates the climber to get to the top? <laughs> Perhaps it's the sense of achievement. Perhaps it's the view. Perhaps that they can tell the story with pride afterwards. What is the motivation that drives someone to achieve anything? Sometimes you get journals and papers expressing the teachers have got to develop higher motivation as if the, somehow we teachers can press a button on a computer, we load in a mo motivation and it just suddenly magically starts to grow in our students. Life is never that simple. And to be honest, motivation is often not under the control of the teacher in any complete sense at all. However, there are simple principles when it comes to motivation. Let's look at these. 
Just follow the logic of this. The motivation to learn depends on attitudes towards learning. If we've got negative attitudes towards learning, then there'll be little motivation to learn in the future. Our attitudes towards learning, that depends on our evaluation of learning. How do we see it? What do we know? What have we experienced? How do we feel? Three dimensions of evaluation. And that depends on experiences which give us the knowledge, the feeling and the doing. Now there's a simple logic to that. So be careful when you read anything about motivation, particularly in education literature. There's good stuff in psychology. Be very careful. This simple model is based on evidence and it gives us something we can hang on to. Because you see, if motivation depends on attitudes, attitudes depends on evaluation, evaluation depends on experiences, if we want to get the motivation right, we go back to the experiences. Get that right, it all drops into place. But how do we get that right? That's the big question. How do we get the experiences of learning correct? The rest then drops into place. So if we want to look at motivation, which is so important in all schooling and university education, indeed in all learning, then we have to go back to the experiences. Somehow we've got to get the learning to come into line with the way young people were designed to learn. And very often the education system asks us teachers to do things that don't come into line with it and then blames us when the motivation falls. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. Now let's look at all human beings. What are we like? What can we say? And again this is based on a vast tract of evidence. One person actually said, and others have quoted and said in different words, human beings are pattern seekers. That's the definition of a human being. Another way of putting at it is we human beings are spending all our time trying to make sense of things. Sense of ourselves. Sense of our relationships. Sense of the world around. Sense of the direction we want to go in. Sense of what we want to do sense making we're seeking understanding pattern seeking we're trying to make sense of everything all around us and we are naturally full of curiosity as one author has observed very 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 clearly you take the young child coming in to the early stages of education they are just bursting with curiosity about how things work they won't perhaps use these words. Why? That's their big word. They keep asking it. And so often with an education, we put them in lines, tell them to sit down, be quiet and listen. And we suppress this natural curiosity. We should be encouraging it because that's the basis of pattern seeking, sense making and learning. Human beings are highly creative. Look at the world we live in today and look at what we human beings have created. Much is good, some of it's bad. But we're questioning. We're always asking questions. Is there a better way, an alternative way? How do we do this? Again, go back to the very young child. Can drive the parents mad, the continual questioning. But it's natural. An education has got to build on that naturally creative questioning curiosity. Young people are seeking to make sense of things. And even we go up to the adolescent teenage years. They're still seeking to make sense of things. 
They're still full of curiosity, different kind of themes and topics maybe. They're questioning still. We've got to allow for that. That's the natural way we human beings are. We mustn't suppress it. We must open the door to other possibilities, to other ways of thinking. But we develop with age. And we all know that there are things you can do with a 16 to 17 year old learner that you can't do with a 6 to 7 year old learner. And it's not just what they know. There's a cognitive development that goes on. And instinctively we teachers try to play and fit our presentations at the right level. Now we don't always get it right, but instinctively we do it. And you can see it with parents, with their children, bringing them up, because that's learning too. We've got to allow for that. Now the first presentation has looked at that. That is fundamental. When anything new is presented to our students, their immediate reaction is to try and fit it in with what they already have got, what they already understand. Now, they don't always get it right. We need to help them. We need to check how they fitted it together. But that's natural. It's the way we human beings were designed. If we get our teaching in line with the psychology of the learners, the way we were designed, then you're going to get satisfaction. Evaluation is going to be higher. And it's amazing how young people can work, indeed how we all work. This creativity is everywhere. Don't suppress creativity. It's right across all subjects. It's not limited to the expressive arts. Allow for the creativity because it helps us to gain understanding. And even encourage it. Because sometimes even though it may go off in directions that are not productive, that can be a stepping stone to something great in the future. So that's what we're like. We've got to get our teaching and learning in line with that. Now again, I'm going to give a sweeping overall picture here. There are many studies that support this picture. When it comes to the attitudes to specific subjects, and I'm going to home in on that because there's a lot of work being done in it. There's been a lot of work done in relation to learning, but mostly with university students and senior school students, learning in general. But let's look at specific subjects where there's been an enormous amount done right through the primary stages and into the secondary stages. And in simple terms, there are three factors that influence attitudes to specific subjects. In other words, our learners evaluate these subjects and the evaluation is based on three factors. Let's look at the three. Now that's what the evidence shows. The best curricula are devised to enable learners to make sense of some area of their life in the context of their society, lifestyle and age. The trouble is that most of our curricula are imposed upon us teachers by adults. The adults may be very committed. So for example, let's take a mathematics curriculum for secondary stages. Usually that's put together by the logic of mathematics, by a team of mathematicians, very few of actually who taught maths at school level, and the whole thing is put together by the logic of mathematics as a discipline. And mathematics is incredibly logical. You get a great sequence out of it. Where does the learner fit? First of all, all these committed mathematicians may be fine, great people with great intentions, but they're not typical of school students. Some of our school students have difficulty seeing why do they need to do mathematics or that particular area of mathematics. Now, focus on the learners, not the mathematics. Now, this has been done in many areas of the curriculum in various countries with remarkable outcomes. 
Now, we don't have much say over that. The curricula are imposed upon us by outsiders. How do the learners see what they're asked to do? You see, if they see the point of it all, I've called it perceived relevance, and that's my phrase summarising what the literature has thrown up. If they can see why they're doing it, where it fits, or put it more precisely, how it brings a benefit to them and enables them to make sense of their life, it's their perceptions. That's a major factor in developing evaluations which lead to attitudes in specific subjects. They don't see the point their attitude and their evaluation become negative and they're not motivated to do much study. But that's the difficult one. The tragedy is when anything ever goes wrong in society, teachers are blamed. We'll see in a minute. In many areas, we don't have the control to change things. Let's just hold that one for the moment and come back to it. Back to our simple picture. Now this is develop, developed not from my opinions, but from various studies. We've got to recognise that we teachers don't have much say over it. We're given a curriculum. We're given the sequence. The examinations determine what's important. And that's not decided by us. Tragically, it's decided by people who have either got limited or no teaching experience. We adults are imposing on the future generations what we adults decide is important for them to know and understand. That needs to be rethought, but that's something we can't deal with here because we teachers don't have any control over it. That's almost a political decision. But look at the quality. Who trains us? In many countries, the tra training is decided, that's not necessarily given, but decided by those outside schools, many of whom have limited or no teaching experience. We don't have control in the way we were trained. We don't have control over the kind of courses that were put through and in service and continuing professional development. We've got something that has to be addressed here but we can't address it here as teachers because we have no control over it. Now this may, cartoon may seem to be trivial but it carries a deep message and it's based on the evidence from research studies. Imagine two students talking to each other, talking about their teachers. We left that one hanging. How do the students see their teachers? What is the basis of their evaluation? Now that's been looked at. And you might say this one saying to the other, my best teachers, uh, hold on to your seat, think this through. This, you're being evaluated all the time, it's natural. My best teachers, and it sounds so obvious, they know what they're talking about, but stop for a minute. Sometimes we're asked to teach things well, we don't have all the background knowledge and experience and understanding. It's not our fault. So people magically say, you're a scientist because you've got a degree in chemistry. Go and teach some biology. And the people who decide that don't recognize that biology is a different discipline. And we're asked to teach biology and we don't have enough background in it. We've got a superficial knowledge and the students pick it up right away. There's strong evidence to show that. They know when we really know and understand it. It comes across. Enthusiasm. Now whatever you're teaching, 
being enthusiastic about it. You can't synthesize it and put it on. It's got to come from within you. Are you really committed and enthusiastic about what you're teaching? Does it make sense to you? Is it important to you? Is it meaningful to you? Do you see its point as part of the educational contribution to the next generation? Our students pick that up right away. Are we committed to it? That comes out of the enthusiasm. Do we know what we're talking about and are we committed to it? But there's some one other thing that's extremely important. It's so simple, but vitally important. We're not just committed to the subject we're teaching. Are we committed as teachers to our learners, as individuals, as well as our class? We want to see our students develop, move forward, gain greater understandings. We can put our feet, as it were, in their shoes and see the learning from their perspective. We can see where there are problems, why there are problems. We're determined and committed to try and help them, to understand them, not condemn them. We're committed to the students even when they make mistakes. We don't learn from successes, we learn from mistakes. Because it allows us to move forward. Now that's, although it's pictured here in a semi-humorous way, <clears throat> this is based on a lot of evidence. There you have your definition of a good teacher. Now this is my picture of it. I was trying to say, how do I put this in one kind of phrase or sentence? That's how I've described it. Just ponder it through. Competent and confident expertise. We do know what we're talking about. We're confident in it. We can see its context. But with strong learner empathy. We can see things from the perspective of the young learner who doesn't have our competence, doesn't have our confidence, doesn't have our expertise yet and who finds it difficult. Just let that simple phrase kind of ring through your brain. That leads to positive attitudes, a positive evaluation and it'll be a step towards great motivation. Competent, confident expertise with strong learner empathy. Some of that's not within our control. Because it depends on our own education of what's been given to us. But it does give us a picture of the kind of evidence that's come up from research. Now let's move forward. I'm going to go back to a model that was developed in the first presentation of this series. This model is not someone's clever idea. You'll find it all over the literature and it's based on very, very strong evidence. It's been confirmed again and again and again. It's been tested almost to destruction. The model is sound. Different books may picture it slightly differently but the overall pattern is always the same. In this world, we are all surrounded by events, observations and instructions. That's going to be true of every classroom and every learning situation. Things are happening. We're seeing things. We're hearing things. We're reading things. It just flies at us in large quantity. And we would never cope with all of that unless we select. And in our brains, there's part of our brains that's involved as what's been called a perception filter. It filters out all the things that we're perceiving that are flying at us to get it into a manageable amount. And what gets through, we put in the working memory. Now for your students, just imagine them in front of you in the classroom right now. All the things they're taking in 
they are selecting. It's automatic. You don't control it. Even they don't control it. It's automatic. It's built into the way the brain was designed. And you don't know what's got through to the working memory. Have the really important things got through? Has too much got through? Have central ideas not got through? You don't know that as you're teaching. It's automatic. And that is there to protect the working memory which has a finite, limited capacity. Most of your brain is that. We call it a long-term memory. It's one great filing cabinet with, if you like, a card index system. A lot of work's been done on that. It's a complex matrix of interlinked ideas. It involves what we know, what we understand, our attitudes, our evaluations, our feelings, our biases, our prejudices, if you like. Everything is there in the long-term memory. It's a store. And it appears to have infinite capacity. No one in a complete lifetime ever runs out of it. But the working memory is the only bit of the brain where understanding can take place. Now what you know already, including your attitudes, your evaluations, that controls their selection in the next lesson. So if attitudes are negative, we've evaluated things negatively, that will affect the perception filter. And many important things will simply never get into the working memory. Now the working memory is called working memory because it's where we mentally work. It's the only bit of the brain where we think, understand and attempt to solve problems in every area of life. And it's a fixed capacity that's limited. Grows with age to about age 16 which is why we've got developmental psychology. It's the critical part because it does the work. So let's fade out the rest. If we want to get the learning experience enhanced which will give better attitudes, better evaluations, greater motivation if you want to enhance the learning experience, you've got to focus on the working memory because that's where learning takes place. That simply is a fact. Not an opinion, not an assertion. There are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of key research studies that have confirmed that. We've got to get our understanding to work within the capacity that each one of us has been given, allowing for the fact that it does vary slightly from person to person. Nothing to do with intelligence, nothing to do with ability, it's just the way we're wired up. It's how you use your working memory that controls how far you get. But the capacity is critical. Get that right. Learning experiences are good. Good learning experiences end up with good evaluations of learning. Good evaluations lead to positive attitudes. Positive attitudes lead to motivation that's positive so that future learning can move forward. So the key to motivation is the logical progression. That's what all of us try to do. It is not natural to memorize. We happen to be quite good at it if we're forced. But it's not in the natural way. The natural way for every human being is to seek to understand. We are sense makers, pattern seekers. We're seeking to understand. So our learning and all that we do in the classroom must be built around that because that's natural. 
And when we can understand, when we do make sense of something, we say, I've got it. Attitudes tend to be positive. And if your attitudes are positive, well, motivation to learn more is enhanced. The logical progression is so simple. The answer is so simple. But it comes back to the natural way for humans to learn is to seek to understand. If they can't understand because the working memory can't cope and they're faced with an examination then they go home and they memorise and they hate it. It isn't natural. Back to our picture of all humans. Reflecting the natural way we've been made, the central goal of all education must be to develop understanding. Not just knowledge, not just filling the heads of our students with facts and information that they can recall and put in an exam paper. No, understanding. Does it make sense? Does it explain things? Does it fit together? Does it make a coherent whole? And the single most important finding from all research is that the understanding which leads to learning success, high motivation and positive attitudes, that's controlled by the limited capacity of working memory. Get that right, everything else drops into place. It's important in every subject, as studies have shown, but it's especially important when you deal with concepts. Now, at school education level, concepts appear in large numbers in mathematics, physics, chemistry, and bits of biology. But they appear in every subject, but they're very marked in the sciences and mathematics. That's why our students find them difficult because the working memory is struggling to cope. Get that right, the rest drops into place. And there are some re quite remarkable studies that have shown that putting that right transforms the performance in examinations, but also transforms attitudes, evaluations and motivation. It's quite dramatic. In one study, where it hadn't been got right, putting it right turned a population that was totally negative towards a subject and didn't want to study it ever again, it turned them into the majority wanting to study that subject next session, next year. It's quite dramatic, the effects. Simple cartoon. Here is our happy student. I can understand what I'm doing. That's because their working memory is coping. They didn't choose their working memory. You can't alter it. Work within it. Its limitations are there for very good reasons. So here we have a student with positive attitudes. A positive evaluation. They're motivated to move forward. But, of course, we've got our unhappy student. I can't make sense of this. And I've got an exam tomorrow. That's why it's not coping. Attitudes are negative. So we need to learn to work within the capacity of working memory and the first person of the series deals with that. Then the other things just drop into place and many studies have shown how to do that. That's what we want in our students and sometimes we get a class where that's true. What a joy it is to teach them. But it isn't always true.
These arise because the learner has got natural satisfaction in what they're being put through. Our happy student. They understand because we made it possible. And the understanding they get is taking them forward in life. The understanding is possible because we're working within the limitations of working memory capacity. And let's remember the limitations are there for good reasons. Work within them, you'll enhance understanding. And the understanding is meaningful for our students because the curricula are built around the learners, not the logic of the subject. Now that's where we've got very limited control. But in fact, we can be subversive in the way we present things by presenting them from the angle of the learners, the perspective of the learners, the context of the learners, the context of their society. Because the logic of the subject is something that we adults have imposed on the subject with hindsight. <clears throat> and if you look at the history of the development of various subjects in the history of mankind, it didn't follow the logic of the subject. It followed the, lead, the needs of the learners who were trying to make sense of it. But we've got to face the fact that that may be a problem. Then we're going to have motivated. Motivated learners. Because they're making sense of what they're doing and it's meaningful. They've evaluated positively. And they've got enthusiastic motivation. Now we're going to look a bit in the next presentation at ways of teaching which will throw some light on working within the limitations of working memory capacity. But let's leave that for the moment. <clears throat> I'll leave you with that positive picture. We teachers do make a difference. And when we come into our teaching with competent and confident expertise, and sadly we're not always given that from our training, we need to work at it, which takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of commitment. But we've got to have the strong learner empathy. We've got to see things from their perspective. There's got to be a sensitivity to how the learners view our subject, how they're coming at it, and where they find problems and difficulties. And we've got to sensitively support them through it. But we do that from the basis of competent and confident expertise. We really do know what we're talking about and we see where it fits into the wider picture and how it's relevant for our learners before us. There's a positive picture that can take us forward and encourage us as we look at attitudes, motivation and the great success that our students will have in a love of learning in the future. Now this list is far from complete. The first reference there will blow your mind, but it's probably the classic work that brings all the research together of that, up to that point, when most of it had been done. Festinger, the next guy, had the brilliant breakthrough that showed how attitudes could be developed. A lot of the papers that follow that are set in the context of the various science and mathematical subjects simply because that's where most of the work has been done, because that's where most students have the greatest difficulty and the greatest attitude problems. But the last reference is a fascinating one. 
because these authors have brought together and built it around the working memory and have developed a wonderful way of looking at learning that's so realistic, so practical, but based on tight research evidence. As with many of the other presentations, we go back to a book of which I was a co-author. And the other co-author working in Lahore in Pakistan as a school principal. Chapters 11 and 12 give a complete overview of the whole area of attitudes and motivations in the context of secondary education, but much applies in both primary and higher education. This is part of a series of presentations. If you photograph that, you'll, you'll go straight to the website or type in the URL and you can see the others in the series of presentations which are an attempt to make a coherent whole as we bring together research evidence as it applies to key areas of the learning process in education for today so that we can take education forward into the future and our learners will be strongly motivated to go on learning throughout their lives.